So just uh, hopefully, Dwayne, don't take offense because I really think this orchard is just darn near perfect, just almost Mary Poppins style. But I would love to see that graft union higher out of the ground. I would too. Okay. I'll see, <laughs> I'll see what was set 10 years ago. Okay. The graft union was about six inches under the ground. Okay. But other than that, it's really a beautiful tree. You can learn a lot by just looking at the history of the tree. Now, I'm judging this is the height of the tree at planting. I can see bud scale scars there. It looks like, Wayne, in the first year you grew it to there. So you got your two feet. Congratulations. That's wonderful. The second year you got another two feet or three, two and a half feet up to here. And then the third year we added only about 12, 13, 14 inches. But you're now very close to the 10 feet. By the way, I can reach eight. So that's pretty close. And that's. So that's really a, a, a phenomenal thing. Um, the tree was not my five to six feet. It was more the four foot high tree. So the nursery could have done a little better job for you, but nevertheless, it turns out really well. The issue of tipping the trees to get them in the cardboard boxes is a problem. In recent years, they've been sending pool trucks to New York where they don't tip them. So they don't necessarily tip everything in the nursery. And they just lay them down in there, stack a whole trailer load full of them. And so we've gotten trees that are the full height. So it's something to work with uh, with your nurseryman. <clears throat> Second point, whenever I plant a tree, I, I said I'd want to have no branches below 24 inches. And so that's pretty much the height of my knee. So I use that whenever I plant. If it's not above my knee, I take it off. The problem is, is your knee. <clears throat> or your knee. So just take a black marker and put a line on your pant leg and then use that. Cut off anything below that. Or you could do that. But I often prune the young trees with hand clippers, nevertheless. The purpose for that is that if the branch is high enough, even hip height is really good, you can tie it down and it doesn't touch the ground. And so you can deal with branches that are vigorous and tying them down without any problems. Second step is any branches that came from the nursery we want to tie down. If this is how high it was, I'm guessing that we had one, two, three, maybe four branches from the nursery. And I don't know if you tied down, but this one looks really nice. It doesn't look like that one got tied down enough. This one here is a little bit to break out there shortly. But nevertheless, the tree still looks really good. It wasn't headed. It wasn't headed. And up there, there was a fruit on that tip. And so it looks like it might have been headed, but that was a fruit that did that. So in that regard, I commend you, Wayne. You've done an excellent job. But now we're here at the start of the fourth year. The trees developed several branches. We got a lot of fruiting spurs, 300 fruiting spurs we just counted. And we're set up for a tremendous nice crop, assuming we don't get into biennial bearing. But we're just now at the first point after planting where we want to do some pruning. I generally do almost no pruning in the second year or in the third year unless there's really a strong upright branch that got away from me and I didn't tie it down and now it's better to take it out. But other than that, I take off very few branches in those first three years. The reason is this. The ones I purchased from the nursery, the feathers, I want to get some apples off them before I cut them off. And secondly, the less pruning we can do, the quicker we can transition that tree into bearing to get this target at 3,000 bushels to the acre in the first five years. The more pruning I do, the less yield I get. So we'll look hopefully in a few minutes at some second year trees and we'll talk about them. But let's talk about a tree that's going into its fourth year. The goal here is to now begin this process of limb renewal pruning. It could be simplified as easy as this. Identify the largest diameter branch and take it off. And walk away. But no, not, I'm not letting you walk away because I want a little more detail. So in this tree, it's that one there. In this tree, it's this one up here. In this next tree, there's none that are big. In this tree, it's probably going to be this one that's wide out here. In this tree, it's going to be this one. So I could walk down that row very quickly, take off one branch, and just really do a great pruning job without because Wayne's done such a great job beyond that of getting the tree up having a dominant leader and having a lot of side branches this is great branch even this little new twig is great this is great this is great those are just all wonderful things so let me pass the mic 
to Mike, <coughs> and just uh, do my pruning. This is a very simple step. I'm going to take out that branch. I want to take it off leaving a stub. It's a very simple type of pruning cut, but I'm going to show you all the way people try to do it wrong. They try to make that angle this way, but when I cut the branch in that angle, the, it's hard to get the bevel in the right direction. I have the bevel going down. I want the angle on that cut to be close to the trunk and then leave a lip on the bottom part. The easiest way to do that is to put the loppers underneath and make that cut. Just about right there like that. Leaving a long lip, leaving it close to the trunk. Over the years we've started lengthening out that stub a little bit. Even that might be quite a little bit short, but that's pretty good. Which shows the potential to grow a new replacement shoot. We don't have to have it, but it works if we can get one. Now this particular um, branch is relatively low. If I don't get one, that doesn't bother me. But up here, when I take that one out, I want the new replacement shoot there. So that's all, the very simplest thing we're going to do. It needs to be done starting year four on every single tree. But now look at that tree. Wayne, are you going to miss those apples? Okay, I said there's two cut rule. Is there a second branch we could take off of this tree that you really bugs you? Okay, who, let's take a vote. Who wants to take off another branch? Look how many nice buds are on that branch. You're just saying that because you're... <laughs> at this age, Orchard, you're going to just do two. Never more than two at this age. And we get up into 10, 11 year old stuff. Sometimes we break our own rules and take out three. Almost never more than three. I use a rule generally of three quarters of an inch in diameter. Is that one bigger than three quarters of an inch in diameter? It's close. Maybe it's right on the borderline. Is that one? They're both on the same borderline. Now Mike Parker reminds me that there's other people in the world that like other rules. And one of the rules that's often talked about, which I like too, is to compare the diameter of the branch to the diameter of the leader right beside it. So the diameter of this one compared to the diameter of the leader. And obviously this one here, the diameter of that branch was not as big as the leader, but it's bigger than half. So if it exceeds half the diameter of the leader, we generally want to take it out. The problem with that rule is <coughs> the trunk keeps growing and by year 15 the trunks are all going to be this big and so a branch half the diameter of that would be way too big for this spacing. That's why I just prefer to say I'm never going to probably let a branch bigger than an inch in diameter. Three quarters of an inch is my rule. When it exceeds three quarters, I want to take it out. If I've got four branches that are all bigger than three quarters, I'm going to force myself not to take them all out, just to take out two. And then come back next year and take out two more. Because of the study we did that says if you take out too many branches, you can reduce yield. Steve, let's leave that for the moment. Let's look, look at it. I still, I'm probably going to take it out, but I'm going to look at it after I print up the tree. The second step is to, we could all say this together, columnarize the remaining branches or simplify them. What does that mean? That means to look for the branch and take off the bigger side branches. Now I'm not counting little stuff like this, but I am counting at the tip to make a single direction for that branch. But now let's columnarize that. That's the reason I didn't want to take it out because it's a great one to talk about columnarizing. What does columnarizing mean? It means taking off this part, this part, and this part so that now I have a single axis and simplifying the end, there's a column of fruit. The purpose of this simplifying or columnarizing is to allow better light exposure to fruits on that on both sides and also to throw some buds on the ground. I have 1400 flowers. I only need, we decided 200 on these trees, 200 fruits. So I use my pruning shears to throw some flower buds on the ground so that the chemical thinning job is not so much. So that tree is done. Um, we still have the issue of this one and this one. I wanted just to show the columnarizing. I'm going to take it off just so you can see what we really like to see is a very narrow columnar tree that is based on this kind of wood. This is really great wood. A couple of apples there will bend that down. A couple of apples there will bend that down, so forth. 
Well, all of these. You wouldn't worry about tying those tie down. No. You just stand on three because you've got your eyes on the So look at it now. It's a very simple tree. Yesterday, well, let me come back to, let me finish up on your point. That what do we want to do about tying down? When I plant the tree, I want to tie down the feathers. But generally after that, with a few exceptions, I'll talk about the exceptions in a minute. I do no other tying for the next 20 years. I depend on fruit to bring this down. If I get this small diameter wood, fruit will always do it. If what I get is really strong, really strong shoots, more than two feet long, fruit won't do it. Then I have to manually tie some of those. That's what I try to avoid. If you have a good climate, like North Carolina, a long climate, and you plant two vigors of rootstock, two vigors of soil, and what you're getting is three feet of growth every year on the side branches, then you've got a problem. That requires tying down. I've run into this a number of places in the world, but the most uh, uh, common one is in Brazil, where I've been going a lot in the last few years, and they basically, if they don't do tying every year on s at least five or six shoots, they get four feet of growth. Now, they don't want to change to the right rootstock because they don't, they're not quite there yet, but the answer has been do more tying, and it works very, very well. But I hope you don't have to do any more tying than that first year. You still don't use Apogee? No, no, no. Well, no, no. We do use Apogee. Not generally in the first five years. But I was talking last night at dinner with Steve, that, uh, Steve McCartney that is, about how a number of our growers, as these orchards have become older than 10 years, start to put on low doses of Apogee in the upper part of the tree. And so two to three applications just in the upper part of the tree, relatively low doses. I don't know if the way we calculate Apogee means anything to you, but three ounces to the acre instead of a traditional rate for fire blight control will be six to 12 ounces. So it's quite low rates just to hold down the growth in the top. We don't ever do it on Honeycrisp. We almost never do it with uh, Empire or um, wheat growing varieties like Red Delicious, but Macintosh, which is our number one variety, is a problem. It wants to grow, and so Apogee really is helpful. On a mature tree, I want about 15 branches to get my 150 apples. I want about 10 apples on every one. Well, on this big one, I can maybe leave more than 10, and so on this small one, I'm going to leave maybe five, but on this one, I might leave you know, eight, but this is still a young tree. So I showed yesterday in my presentation, there's a little plastic ruler we've developed so on young trees, we want to adjust the crop load to just the right number of fruit. And we've developed this small little uh, ruler guide that tells us how many apples we should leave based upon the diameter of the trunk. So the way to use this is we just find the right diameter semicircle about a foot off the ground. And we find the right one that fits the size of that trunk, which is this one right here. And then there's two numbers on it, H and G number. The H stands for Honeycrisp, the G is for Gala. And this one says we should have... Since it's a Fuji, it's more like Gala, we should have about 68 apples on the tree. And that's a guide then when we hand thin to determine how many apples to leave on the tree. I'm guessing, based on the size of that tree, we should only have about 70 apples. So how many branches do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, plus a liter is 15. And I need 70. I need about 5 or 6 apples per branch. And then it's going to go up to around 10 when the trees mature. My second point is, you don't need 25, 30 branches on a tree like this. I've got a lot of branches in there, even though I've taken out two, two big ones. OK, I've asked Steve to join me here for a minute. We're just going to prune at the pruning speed the next five trees. Now, don't ever make a mistake, OK? <laughs> We're going to take off. I'm going to take off one big branch, you get to take off one, and we're going to columnarize the remaining ones, okay? I get the easy one. Well, we're not going to count this one. <laughs> we got to step it up here a little bit. Top's all great. Okay, onward. I'm going to just columnarize that. I'm going to help you out.
Yeah, you can get that one out for us. It's really easy. We'll slow down for a little minute here. This is an interesting case. This is a branch I could take out, but I could keep. It's relatively big, but it's got a lot of fingers. Bob, where's your, who had the question? Marvin, those are fingers. I could take it off right here and sort of turn the angle of this branch down that way. I could keep the angle going straight out to the tractor. If you had planted these 12 feet, I would definitely try to turn that angle of that branch by cutting it off here so it didn't go straight out into the tractor wheel. Or I could turn it right here. But with 14 feet, that's no problem. So I could do it either way. I'm just going to show you this as a way that I like to have that branch look when I'm done with it. Let's go ahead now, Steve. Just columnarize the remaining ones and don't take out more than two. Unless there's an exception to the rule, which we hopefully there's not too many exceptions per acre. Yeah, take off that low one. Oh, I should have looked at this more. Yeah, I got to take out both. But you take out yours, and then when nobody's looking, we'll take out the other one. <clears throat> okay. Two or three big ones on each tree. Two or three what? Large diameter. That's all you want to take out. That's all we want to take out, exactly. Somebody kick all the brush out for us because we're not doing a very good job here. <clears throat> okay, this one's a little low. We can take it out. But there's very little work to do. This is the fourth year. Take off one. Columnarize what's left. There's a great one for you on that side. Before you cut them, t t tell us what you're doing. If you right, what one, you, what what big one, one are you out? taking out there? On this two. <clears throat> that lower one there? Mm -hmm. I'd probably take him out. It's your tree, your side. Go right ahead. Now, justify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, your decision. <clears throat> I, I, by the way, I agree with it. So. Since he's your since he's your lower limb, and this is a six foot spacing, I think you are going to have to. In my mind, you are going to have to keep. That's going to have to be what you hate as a, as a lower scaffold limb. That's going to have to be, a, you know, six foot spacing. You're going to have to have some permanent branches, I think, for this spacing. If these were three foot, you would have to take. I mean, for four foot, I think all that's got to come out. You have to redo that. So I agree with you, Steve. I like this one because it was a little more going at a little bit of a diagonal angle instead of straight out to the tractor, I can take off a couple of side branches and have a nice a columnarized branch. It's not as odd angle as that other one. That's good. <clears throat> so, so did we only get one off of this tree? This branch here is okay. Uh, I want to emphasize that you don't have to fix the tree completely in one year. You can leave it ugly and take out another one next year. As long as every year you're willing to take out one branch, it'll get fixed. The concept I now want to have you think about is this. The tree starts a little wide because of those feathers that came from the nursery and they grow out a little bit. But starting in year four, we take out one or two branches per year and over the next three years, all of a sudden, it becomes narrow. Why? Because of these original branches that were sticking out here so far, especially that one on the second tree that was this high sticking way out here, it's gone. Now when I look down this tree row, it's narrower. Next year as I take out more lower big long branches, it's going to become even more narrow. This is why. 14 feet sounds okay in the beginning. I got slope, I don't want my tractor slide, all that. But when the tree ends up narrow, you say, dang, I wish I would have gone to 12. Because of this style of pruning, this branch that you're thinking is hitting my tractor, it's going to be gone in another 10 seconds. So it, it, the tree's going to be narrowed up. And now the tree just looks different than what it did before. Let's go ahead. 
Now, there's three, tree, three branches on this one, one, two, and three that should come out. This one's kind of below this other one. This is a little bit higher, maybe better. But since he decided to take that one out, now I'm forced to leave that one for a year. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But <laughs> I told him he could take one, so that's, that's fine. But we can live with it for a year. But I'm going to just simplify it a little bit. Pick one. Pick one. That's a perfect one because this is a small. It'll last a long time. It's already down. This will last forever. That's that's pretty good. That's really nice. A little bit longer stubs than what we were doing in the past. Almost an inch long. Uh, the sloppy you are, the better. On this stuff out here, though, if you cut it close, it might have a tendency to. Or yeah, for the tree to break. If right. Less it, to if they're really the same diameter, then that weakens that area. But yeah. that's the stubbiness is uh, just a simple way to. So I, I got the problem on my side over here. Once again, put your loppers underneath. That's a way to get the best angle. I get. I think you get the idea. It's a very simple concept. Now. This is a great first step. I hope you have more open land. <laughs> well, I'm, on, I'm on my twilight. I'm, I'm going out instead of going up. I'm going out. I don't agree with that one bit. Every one of you, is, none of you are too old to plant new orchards and make a lot of money in the next few years. Grady Orr will prove that. As the business go up in value. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Grady Orr will prove that. He didn't start until he was 65. And he really kept planting to the day he died. So plant new orchards, but each step, time, just go a little bit closer, especially on Honeycrisp. It works so well at three feet by 12. You've got the trellis idea. I should have commented on that. You've got a beautiful trellis. I should have had one more wire, though. I put four wires everywhere else, maybe more than that. Did you put conduit everywhere or not? I did. I went ahead and put conduit on everything because I started with it, but it's got to where now it's up to two dollars a stick, and you get a thousand trees, three but well, you got two thousand dollars in conduit. Exactly. So maybe you can go away from the conduit if you put more wires and less conduit. And that's exactly what we're tending to do. There's some growers that still say there's such a value in keeping that leader straight. I don't care what it costs because I just drew on the board. You're counting some chickens before they hatch, but I've given you how many thousands of dollars in the first five years? Well, I forgot already. I think it was eight thousand and or. I thought it was a different point five hundred bushel and dollars bushel. Yeah. Okay. So. You've got uh, a lot of thousands to play with, whether you want to put conduit or not. Um, but most people are now going to four wires or five wires. The key point, which I should try to drill into your heads, if you don't put a stake, it can either be bamboo or conduit, or what a lot of New York growers do, they string a soft wire with a pneumatic clip gun where they can staple it to that wire. It's a pneumatic crimp and they staple it to the top wire, and then they just have this little tiny soft wire serving as the guide for the leader. All three of those systems, conduit, bamboo, or what we call the wire support system, the leader system, work to keep that leader growing. If you don't use that and you just use horizontal wires, you have to remember this one point. How am I gonna make you all remember this? Whatever part of that tree is above a wire where it's tied has to be defruited within one month of bloom. So suppose the leader grew to here, we have a wire, and the next wire is all the way up there, and we have the leader halfway in between. And I cut some apples on it. Those apples will bend that lever over, either break it or bend it, and I won't get to the next wire. So you have to go through it with your hand thinners, whether it's on the ground or on a platform, whatever of the leader extends above that last wire where it's tied has to be defruited, 100% defruited. And then it can work. You can keep that leader growing until it gets to the top. Parents, I asked you this question yesterday and you told me, <coughs> you want this to the <coughs> top wire by the end of the second leaf. And me and Greg have had this discussion on what to do with ours. What do you do with it when you, when you get it to the top? Okay, the question is, after it gets to the top wire, then what? 
good example would be the next <coughs> row over. Yeah. Uh, that, we, is that the M7 over there? Yeah. 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 Let's go over there where there's a little more of a challenge. These Honeycrisp are too easy. This has been a production of BRCC TV, the education channel, in conjunction with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension, empowering people, providing solutions.